Welcome to the Fine Arts Theater on the University of Georgia campus. I'm Alan Fleury. We're all fascinated with stars of the stage and screen, and on this episode of Unscripted, we'll visit with the real thing. Actor Brian Reddy has appeared in over 50 feature films and television shows, from the Coen Brothers' Oh Brother Where Art Thou and The Birdcage, to episodes of Law and Order, Seinfeld, The Good Wife, and The X-Files. But Reddy's first love remains the stage, and he has made his name on and off Broadway, including two world premieres at the Lincoln Center Theater in New York. A 1977 Master of Fine Arts graduate of UGA, Reddy returned to campus to star in the University Theater production of Arthur Miller's All My Sons. We'll share a few scenes from the production. Between rehearsals, I spoke with Reddy at the State Botanical Garden of Georgia. The, the chairman of the department at the University of Georgia when I was uh, here was a man named Dr. Leighton Ballou, who was a legendary teacher uh, in the Southeast. And he really uh, felt that I needed to be in a company. And in those days, there were a lot more theater companies available. And he just said, you, you need to find a place where you can grow and get better. And uh, he said, just because you're a young character actor, you're not going to come into your own until a little bit later. And uh, I was very, very fortunate that I got into a, a group called The Acting Company in New York. Uh, John Hausman, the late John Hausman, started this company out of the first class of Juilliard. It was Patti Lapone, Kevin Klein, David Ogden Stiers, a lot of really great, great actors. And they, m Mr. Hausman, wanted them to have more of the British experience, which was you would go through your training and then join a, a repertory company and work day in and day out as an actor, mm -hmm. you know, with different directors. So he created this group called The Acting Company, which was four younger actors, and it toured the country. We were part of the Kennedy Center, and we used to do a residency in New York. And I was very, very fortunate. It had been in existence about eight, 10 years, and I got in it uh, when I moved to New York after my second year there. Uh, and from that, I was worked with the top voice teacher from Juilliard for two years. Uh, on, in, in a tutoring uh, uh, situation. So I have a lot of uh, vocal uh, uh, training. And the students now back to our, you know, are very aware of that. And they, I've noticed that they've lifted their, uh, their working harder uh, and, and better uh, vocally than they were uh, before. And it's not like having a, a professor or a faculty member that you're working with. That's right. This is someone else who's. This is someone who's coming off the stage from somewhere. That's right. Right, and who's hitting the back of the room, as you were saying. That's right, and effortlessly. And I'm not. I'm not talking about myself. Because it's a part it's, of your craft. That's right. And and you need to know how to do that. You know, and I've been doing it now for thirty years. All right, and that. From the moment I've walked in, they're, they've, they're really willing to listen and jump in and work, you know, and they're, they're in, they've embraced my being there and, uh, and want to get the most that they can out of it, you know. Mm -hmm. And they're just, they're terrific. And they're all at different levels, right. you know. I originally had thought I was just going to be working with the graduate students, and I was a little surprised when I got here. There's, there's two graduate students who are, who are um, this is their thesis project because uh, uh, there's three or four great, great roles uh, in, in um, All My Sons. The, the son, uh, uh, a daughter, and a brother uh, that are all easily in their mid-twenties, you know. So they're great roles for, for these. 
But as it turns out, they also have an older uh, woman who's getting her MFA, mm -hmm. uh, who's in her, uh, she's not an older woman, but. Right, she's age appropriate. Age appropriate. Well, well put. <laughs> uh, and uh, and the, the mother, Kate, is a, a great uh, role. So there's only two of them, uh, the, the daughter and, uh, and the, the mother. The rest of them are undergraduates mm -hmm. who are in different uh, places, different levels. And there's one that's just uh, in his first year um, here. I think he's a transfer, like a sophomore, but it's his first uh, show. And uh, another two are seniors who have been doing uh, shows. And they're just great. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but they're very, very different levels in their development as actors. And um, at first I was a, a little surprised, and then I thought, this is kind of wonderful. I've embraced it, you know, because um, that's what we're here for, you right. know, for them to work with a professional and each of them grow from where they are. And they'll take that and go, go to the next one. And they know? haven't been intimidated having a star of stage and screen? In well, I, I try to tell them I'm a legend in my own mind, but it just it hasn't seemed to work. But uh, no, no, they're not intimidated. You've done um, uh, an, an Arthur Miller play previously. I did uh, The Crucible, uh, which uh, 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 Tony Randall, uh, uh, the great Tony Randall, uh, uh, it had been his life dream to form a, a theater company in, in New York, uh, and he did it later in his life. And it was called the actor, uh, the National Actors Theater, and he wanted to use a, a classical company on Broadway. I was doing a production off Broadway a few years before that. I was playing Iago in, a, in Othello in a wonderful theater company called Theater for a New Audience, which is very highly regarded theater in New York. And Tony, who goes in those days, Tony would go to everything, so it was not unusual to have Tony Randall show up. Uh, and, and he was wonderful. He, he looked like Felix still, you know, I mean, <laughs> it, it, some men sort of stop and Felix, he, Tony sort of stopped in like circa 1975 in his clothes, you know. It's, so uh, he came in and shook my hand and said he really liked it. And he said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start a theater company. And when I do, I want you in it. And uh, I thought that was, you know, incredibly flattering and, and, and lovely. And I went on, did some other things. About a year and a half later, the woman I used to be with in those days, she turned to me one day, she said, Tony Randall's on the phone for you. And I said, get out of here. She said, no, he is. And he said, I'm doing it, we're, we're starting. And so I did his first uh, season. And The Crucible was part of that. And uh, Arthur Miller was alive still then. And um, I got to tell you, the first run through, uh, I played Reverend Paris, who was the, 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 the preacher in the town. And it's his daughter and his niece, Abigail, who start the um, rumors about uh, being bewitched. Right. Um, and I started the play um, I'm at my daughter's bedside and she's in a coma such and I'm praying over it. and just out of the corner of my eye I see this sort of large person sit down in a folding chair like about the distance you are from me now. Very big legs. He's look up and it's Arthur Miller. And I thought, oh dear God. He's America's greatest living playwright, and I'm about to start his play. <laughs> but he was—he was really um, quite wonderful. He's—he was a man of few words, uh, but he was—he uh, he came over to me and he said, "I never felt like I wrote that right." And I, I thought that was such an interesting thing for an artist of his caliber, 25 years later, to be thinking about that role in that way, and. I don't know if you know, there was a movie made of The Crucible oh, yes. with Daniel Day-Lewis. Right. Well, his daughter, Daniel Day-Lewis is married to Arthur Miller's daughter. His right. daughter directed that film. Well, I went to see that, and this was several years after I'd done the play. And the character of Reverend Paris had two extra scenes in the movie. He and went back in? He had gone back in, and they weren't, mu they weren't big. Right. One was they a, wouldn't be, though. One was a sermon, one, but it just rounded the character out. Yeah. And I thought, that's what a great artist. He never stopped working on it. He finally got a chance to fix uh, that role the way he wanted it. Uh, Martin ever... Sheen was the uh, lead in that production. He was John Proctor in it. And uh, a lot of great New York theater actors. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like a place where a lot of great actors have cut their teeth on, on those quintessential Arthur Miller roles. I was just thinking about Willie Loman. Oh. You know, they actually talked, uh, Dr. Saltz, David Saltz, who's the chairman of the department, they actually, uh, we started talking about this a few years ago, 
uh, when uh, the group, I belong to a group of uh, alumni who uh, went to Georgia. We formed a group in New York in the late 70s, early 80s called New Georgia. Uh, and, uh, you know, we obsessively just really had a good time, but we, we also have gone on to very diverse uh, careers. Uh, they're producers, designers, mm -hmm. directors, actors. Um, we should explain a little bit about that. These were UGA alums who were living in New York and working in different areas of the entertainment field. That's correct. That's and correct. getting together for... That's right. And we were all part of the theater program at Georgia, but some of uh, them branched out. Like uh, one, one Carl Clifford, uh, uh, he was an acting, directing uh, student, and he went uh, into film production mm -hmm. and worked his way up and, and worked for many years for Ron Howard. He was uh, uh, his line producer, production uh, uh, coordinator. He's been associated with some really great films, Apollo 13 and mm -hmm. many others, and people like that. And uh, they, they brought us back a few years ago, D Dr. Saltz, uh, was informed about this group and, and wanted us to connect back with the theater department and about four or five years ago they they brought us back and uh, we used to celebrate Thanksgiving together every year that became our, our thing we had the New Georgia Thanksgiving which became a, a big thing at in someone's the, apartment in New York, in New York. Uh, and uh, we, well there was a place we called New Georgia oh, which yeah. was the first sort of apartment where we all lived Potluck? It was Wayne Knight oh absolutely Potluck. <laughs> and we borrowed tables from a church across the street I was the only Catholic they said go over and ask that priest for nasty <laughs> tables and, and we did and Carl Clifford worked in a restaurant and I don't want to say purloined, but we borrowed, uh, you know, uh, like 20 servings of silverware and napkins from this restaurant. You've got to have those. And we replaced them all the next day and brought them back. And uh, it became a tradition that we celebrated together off and on uh, different times over 20 years. Wow. Uh, uh, and everybody's sort of spread out now and gone uh, a lot of different ways. And some years were bigger than, than others. But uh, it's always been a really, really lovely uh, uh, part of our journey. Um, so uh, the University Theater Department brought us down and had Thanksgiving uh, dinner for us uh, about, I, I wish I could remember, it was about four or five years ago. And David Saltz at that time said, you know, we'd be really interested in you coming and doing a guest artist. And I said, I'd, I'd be open to that. They started their reconstruction of the theater, so mm -hmm. it was put off for a year or two. And I've been working and doing different things. And I was doing this play at Lincoln Center last year. David came up to see it, the John Guare play, uh, Free Man of Color. Uh, and he said, we've been thinking, um, and they had, they had actually mentioned Willie Loman uh, uh, as a, one of the show, uh, shows they were. And he said, uh, Ray Paulino, who's the head of the performance department, who's the director of this, said he actually thought that um, All My Sons was a better fit. And as soon as he said that, I went, you know what? You're right, <laughs> you know? Uh, Joe Keller is such a quintessentially middle-class American guy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, he, he's the he's the, the the Kellers were the family where all the kids played in their backyard and you know ran into the house to get grape drinks in the summertime. Or, you right. know, and right. uh, uh, you know, and I, I just really connected more with. He was a real working-class kind of guy. Mm -hmm. Then you couldn't have made a complete inspection of the neighborhood. When I first made you a policeman, you used to come in every morning with something new. Now, nothing is ever new. Well, there were these kids in 30th Street. They started using a hand on the block, but I made them go away because you were sleeping. Now, you're talking. Now, you are on the ball. You keep this up, I'm not going to make you detective. Can I see the jail now? See the jail in the lab, Bert. You know that. Don't ask questions. 
I liked it when I first heard that you were doing all my sons so the department was instead of death of a salesman because it's a lesser known work in my eyes. It is. Uh, it was his first work written in 1947. Right. And it really made his career. Mm. It was a huge, huge success. But it was his very first uh, uh, play to really uh, uh, achieve it. And I'm not sure of what awards it won, but I, it, uh, it was up there. Um, but it really came right after World War II in that experience. And, and the play deals, you know, with a, a, a Joe ostensibly sells, uh, lets defective equipment for airplanes uh, to, to go through, and it ends up killing 21 pilots. Right. And so it's about the moral and ethical um, uh, fallout from, uh, from the conflict of doing business and war and, and moral responsibility. And uh, his son is a returning veteran. His other son, we don't know, has mysteriously died, is missing mm -hmm. in action. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so it really resonated with those audiences at, at that it's time. It's a touchy subject, right touchy after a subject, war. Right after a war. I mean, we're talking 1947, I think it was it opened in 48, 49. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so it was really four or five years, and, and all most of the people almost every person who went to see that play in those times was touched by that. Um, so it was a very powerful play and resonated. Mm -hmm. I think over time it's been considered, it's, it's a young man's play, and it's, it's a little harsh for some people's taste morally because it's really judgmental. Mm -hmm. But I think if you really deal with the play deeply, you see that it's m much more nuanced than, than what it appears because it's sort of seen from the sons, you know, how could you do this, you, you know. And yeah, the father is... Some of that optimism is shining that's right. through. And the father keeps saying, there's a th thing that goes, runs through it, he says, see it human, see it human. And uh, all of them are in denial a little bit about what is going on, mm -hmm. you know. And it finally, and it's also just incredibly perfectly written play. It takes place in a 24-hour period in a backyard. So it follows sort of the Greek and, and well-made play constructions uh, of uh, earlier times, and, and it just goes chick, 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 to an inevitable conclusion that happens on the very last page. The one thing uh, is not that, so there's no argument. Now, come. In a minute. Now, no, listen. Annie. All right, Beth, forget it. No, no, she doesn't. Like this, I'm any of all subject. Now cut it out. You want her to go on like this? The cylinders went into P40s only. What is the matter with you, huh? Larry never flew a P40. So who flew those P40s? Pigs? The man was a fool. Don't make him out to be a murderer. You got no sense, huh? Look what this does to her. You gotta appreciate what was doing in the shop in the war. I mean, the bolt in there. It was. It was a madhouse. I mean, the majors calling every half hour for new heads. They're ripping us with the telephone. Trucks are driving out hot every year. No, you know, just see it human. See it human. So, all of a sudden, a batch comes out with a crack. That happens. That's the business. A small hairline crash. All right. So, so, your father, he's a, a little man. He's afraid of loud voices, what will the major say, half-day production loss, what will I say, you know what I mean, human. So he takes out his tools and he covers up the cracks. All right, that's, that's bad, that, that's wrong, but that's what a little man does. But I, if I had been there, I, I would have gone in, I would have said, Steve, jump him, we can afford him, but alone, he was afraid. But I know he meant no harm. He believed they hold up 100%. That's a mistake, but it ain't murder. What a great experience for the students and for you to come back here and be involved in a, in a piece like that. Yeah, it's a great role, yeah. it, it, you know, first and foremost, you know, and so, uh, and it was just a, when Ray suggested it and, and said that they had an MFA student who could play my wife that would be age appropriate, I thought, We're, we've really got something here because these students, cause the, it's not a big stretch for them in, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and, and they're all just doing great. Right. You know, I, I think 
they, they really are um, uh, thinking in a very um, creative and imaginative ways while, you know, building a, a, a wonderful faculty mm -hmm. here. I know that uh, Dr. Saltz told me that they just added a nationally uh, known uh, Shakespearean scholar That's to right. the faculty. Mm -hmm. So. I really think they're doing great things. They, they are, they are yeah. no doubt, to go alongside the new theater. Yeah. We should probably switch to your um, your own stage and screen career a little bit. A little bit. Now, yeah. your your TV resume reads like the zeitgeist of American culture over the last 20 years. <laughs> yeah. Everything. Yeah. Law and Order, X-Files, yeah. Buffy the Vampire Slayer, All Gilmore right. Girls. Yeah. I, um, I lived in Los Angeles in the 90s, and so all of those, uh, I was the zeitgeist for the culture of the 90s, right. you know, Seinfeld and uh, all of those things, Martin. And it's also very interesting, uh, I can always tell when people stop me where they're coming from, you know, if they're a Seinfeld <laughs> fan or a Martin fan or a Buffy, you know, it's very, very interesting how what it says about them as much as, uh, you know, uh, what I, what I may or may not have done. But um, in 2002, I was offered a, a, a director that I used to, that I really adored, a man named Jerry Gutierrez, asked me to come back to do a play at Lincoln Center, a revival of Dinner at Eight, which was a Kaufman-Ferber play from the 30s, which really resonated, uh, it was about the Depression period, and was resonating with their sort of jittery economy mm -hmm. already then. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was really, wanting to, to do some theater uh, again, and, and I had been thinking about relocating back to New York. So I've been in New York, I decided to stay, and I've been working in New York for the last nine, almost 10 years, since 2000, late 2002, 2003. And uh, uh, so I've done very, very little television since then. Occasionally, you can, you can get a, a television show from the other coast, but they don't do it as much anymore, right. uh, primarily economics. So it's know. less your, your, your interest hasn't waned in it, your focus has changed. That's correct. Right, and that's so when correct. you were out there, it was more geographical. You were out there and that, you were right. getting more TV work. That's right, and I actually went out there to get a television series, that was my goal. And while I was getting, uh, working toward getting a television series, uh, I was guest shotting, which is the traditional way you, you, you build up your uh, resume there, and I was doing, uh, I just ended up doing a lot. I did about 30 of them in, uh, mm -hmm. over a period. Some of them were, truthfully, uh, some of them were wonderful guest starring mm -hmm. roles. Some of them were what I used to call, here's your pie man roles, you know, and, and they, they were pretty utility uh, roles that were, at first I thought, oh, I shouldn't, you know, and then my agent said, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but um, I was, my primary goal was for, to pilots and I and I did like three pilots mm -hmm. and unfortunately they didn't uh, they didn't go and I was reaching a point where I didn't think that was going to happen and so I thought I can stay here and continue to be a working actor in Los Angeles which is not a bad thing mm. but I without bragging or tooting my I am a first class New York theater actor right and that is a not a bad thing to be right. in life. And I thought, well, if I'm not going to get that series, I'm, I'm going to put myself back in a place that I'm stronger, right. that is more challenging, and the work is more satisfying. So that precipitated that move back to New York right. in, in 2003. So that was all. It was just a change of direction in, in what I was focused on. Mm -hmm. But being involved in pilots and trying to get those established, I'm sure that's challenging as well in different ways. It was very uh, challenging, and it's a different profession in, in certain ways. You know, it's very interesting, and I also had a bit of a film career during that period too, which I really enjoyed, mm -hmm. quite frankly. I mean, and, it, and it's very interesting because each one exploits different parts, uh, but film with with particularly auteur or really good film directors, Scorsese, the Coen brothers, uh, Mike Nichols, any of those kind of people that, that I got the chance to work with, they want the most interesting and unique part of you. They want to exploit that in the good sense. Mm -hmm. They want to exploit that and bring that out and on camera and, and, and uh, use that. Television wants the exact opposite. They flip that. They want you to fit a, di uh, a demographic of what they want in terms of their audience. Right. So there's a different mind, it's a different shift in focus in the way they, they hire. And for television, even though I worked quite a lot and they liked me, and, and, and they're wonderful people involved, very talented people mm -hmm. in many instances, they, 
I was never, they could never quite figure out what to do with me. And I was always a little slightly off center to where they were sort of wanting their fit to mm -hmm. be. And I, and I did do some interesting things, you know, like the high talker on Seinfeld or, or, or something like that, or the redneck who closes up um, Martin's uh, radio station, you know. They, and they, they would always love those kind of things. But to translate that to a series regular, which um, uh, became more challenging. And I finally thought, you know what, I don't think this is my medium. I think theater and film are, are I'm better suited to it. I and mean, I'm, I had I'm some success in film, but I'm, I'm a very successful theater actor. Mm -hmm. Very successful. And I'm not apologizing, you know, that's just. No, you shouldn't. You yeah, are. You yeah. are. And uh, so I thought, well, this is where the good Lord tells me to go. And then uh, this is where I need to be. You know, yeah. and I've been back in it ever since. And uh, you know, it's it's very challenging. It's physically demanding, especially as you get a little older. <laughs> it, it, uh, you know, when you do it eight times a week, but it's it's also incredibly satisfying. Are you ever frustrated when people recognize you on the street for a television role and you want to say, "But I've been in." There was a small period of time, quite quite a long time ago now, that I went through that a little bit and then one day I woke up and realized that that is foolish yes to, to, to do that and also that you need to be kind to it, it, when when people meet you this is this is the only time you know and if you if you are short with them or or you know they're, that's the only time you're going to probably meet in your life right. and it's going to be a negative thing for them and I, I realized that don't ever do that illusions are a tender thing yeah yeah and don't ever do that just you know the, you know, they they wish to express that and some happiness or or uh, uh, however small mm -hmm. that, that that they enjoyed that and, and you needed to acknowledge that and thank them. That's a good rule of thumb. Yeah, it really is. You know, and you need to find your own unique route through your career anyway. It sounds like that's what you've done. That's that's right. That's right. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, pretty good. You know, <laughs> and and be. To be happy with what you've given, and uh, and and have respect for what you do, you know, and still really feel challenged and uh, and love it, mm -hmm. you know, is a, a very fortunate thing in life. <laughs>